Okay, so we are back with the hawk and the dove and we finished chapter one. Um, and they are setting us up for stories. And what's gonna happen here is she's gonna flip back and forth between being with her mother and present day and these stories her mother told her about, um, basically about a monastery um, from many years ago. So her mother's gonna start with the story and this chapter is gonna be number two, Father Columbia. When I was a girl, a bit younger than you, my mother began. I had someone to tell me stories too. It wasn't my mother who told me stories though. It was my great grandmother and her name was Melissa, like yours. Great grandmother Melissa told me all sorts of stories, stories about my uncles and cousins, about my great aunt Alice, who was a painter and lived in a little stone cottage at Bell Busk in Yorkshire. Old Aunt Alice's cottage was one of the row of terraced cottages, all the same except that Aunt Alice's was painted in psychedelic colors. Great grandmother Melissa told me about my auntie's duck that had four legs and she took me to see it too. She told me about one of my far off ancestors who was found on the doorstep as a tiny baby in a shopping bag. She told me about my cousin's dog, Russ, who bit off a carol singer's finger and about my grandfather's dog that had to be put down because it loved him so much it went out one night and killed 20 hens and piled them all up on his doorstep. She told me about how she and her sisters took it in turns to pierce each other's ears with a needle and a cork and socks stuffed in their mouth to stop them screaming so that their mother wouldn't find out what they'd done. All kinds of tales, she told me, and all about our family. But the ones I liked best were about a monastery long ago. These stories have been handed down grandmother to granddaughter for 700 years. They came from a long ago great uncle Edward who lived to be nearly 100 and was a very wise old man. At the end of his life when his blue eyes were faded and his skin was wrinkled and his hair reduced to white wisps about his bald head, although he had the bushiest of eyebrows and whiskers that grew down his nose, uncle Edward would while away his days telling stories to his visitors. The one who had the stories from him was his great niece. She was a Melissa too. This Melissa began handing down the stories and they came down through the generations until my great grandmother in the evening of her life as she came into the twilight would sit with me and tell me that long ago, Uncle Edward's stories. And now I will tell them to you too. Great Uncle Edward was a monk at the Benedictine Abbey of St. Aleutian on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors. He had been a wandering friar in the order of the Blessed Francis of Assisi and had spent his life roaming the countryside preaching the gospel. But as time went by and his 60th birthday came and went, he felt a need for a more settled life. So after 40 years of preaching throughout the English shires, he entered the community of Benedictines at St. Aleutian's Abbey in Yorkshire, far away from his family's home near Eli, but just as cold and windy. Great Uncle Edward, now Brother Edward, was made the infirm infirmarian of the Abbey. That is to say, he took care of the monks when they were ill. For in his wandering days with the Franciscan friars, he had picked up a wealth of healing lore. He was skilled in the use of tisanes, T-I-S-A-N-E-S, I don't know that word, and poultices. Poultices are like things you put on um, wounds, herbal salves, salves, and spiced wines and aromatic oils. And he could set a bone or repair a wound as well as any man. So he settled down at the, at St. Lucian's and gave himself to the work of nursing the sick and caring for the old under the rule of life of St. Benedict. In the year 1303, Brother Edward's 60th, and I'm trying to see um, where Yorkshire is. I'll look that up before the next read um, and find out where it is. I wanted to show you the picture here on the front too, give you kind of a picture of the monks. In the year 1303, Brother Ed Edward's 66th, when he had been four years at the Abbey, the good old abbot of the monastery, Father Gregory of the Resurrection, died peacefully in his sleep with a smile on his face, overburdened with years and glad to enter into peace of the blessed. The brothers were sorry to lose him, for he had ruled them gently with kindness and authority, knowing how to mingle mercy with justice so as to get the best out of his flock and lead them in their life of work and prayer. The sorriest of all was Father Chad, the prior of the monastery, second in command under the abbot. So the abbot, who was Father Gregory, he's died. And the second in command is Father Chad, and he, upon whose shoulders now fell the burden of responsibility for the community until they had a new abbot. So he's basically got to be in charge until they hire a new abbot or appoint a new abbot. Father Chad was a shy, quiet man of prayer, a man of few words, a gentle, retiring man. He was not a leader of men. He had no idea why he had been chosen to be prior and was horrified to find the greatness of the abbacy thrust upon him. 
With a small sigh of regret, he left the snug prior cell, which was built against the warm chimney of the brother's community room, the warming room, and installed himself in the large, draughty apartment, which was the abbot's lodging. Day and night he prayed that God would send a new abbot soon, and day and night he prayed that they wouldn't choose him. It was the usual thing when the abbot of the monastery died for the brothers to elect from among their number the new Lord Abbot. The brothers of St. Aleutians prayed hard, and the more senior of the brethren spent long hours in council. But though they prayed long and considered earnestly, they came reluctantly to the conclusion that there was no brother among them with the necessary qualities of leadership to follow in Father Gregory's footsteps. So they appealed to the bishop to choose them a new superior from among the brothers of another monastery and said they would abide by his choice and accept whomever he sent to rule over them. Before too long, word came from the bishop that he would himself be presenting their new superior to them. Since he had to travel through their part of the world on his return home to Northumbria from a conference with the king in London. Okay, so we are over in England. That's what I thought, Yorkshire. He would visit them on his way, bringing their new abbot with him. The new abbey reverberated with excitement, all except for Father Chad, who dreaded playing host to both a bishop and an abbot. And the bishop is over the abbot, and the bishop's going to elect the new abbot for them. Great Uncle Edward did his best to encourage him. Put a brave face on it, Father Pryor. Chin up. Never say die. Tis only one night when all's said and done. Then you'll be back to your cozy nook by the warming room flues and leave this windy barn to the new man. God help him. The bishop gives you his name in that letter, does he? Father Chad looked at the letter from the bishop, not that he needed to. He had read and reread it a dozen times that morning, and he knew the contents of it near enough by heart now, but he ran his finger down the script to make sure. Here, Father Columbia, the sub-prior from St. Peter's near Eli. Ely. He says E-L-Y. He says very little about him. We shall have to wait and see. Ely. I was born and bred on the fens near Ely. My nephew took the cowl at St. Peter's. I wonder, Columba, you say? Columba the dove? No, no, wouldn't be him. No sane man would have named that lad after a dove. You'll eat with us, Edward, when they come tonight. Father Chad tried to sound casually friendly, but Edward knew panic when he saw it. I shall count myself honored. I'll go now and get my chores done early. There's old Father Lucanus suffering with the pain in his shoulder and neck again. I must spend some time with him, give him a rub with ar aromatics. It eases the ache wonderfully. Brother Edward stood up slowly and strolled across the bare, comfortless room to the great oak door. He paused in the doorway and looked back. Father Chad sat in the imposing carved chair, staring gloomily at the letter on the huge, heavy table before him. Time and the out hour outrun the longest day, Father Chad, said Brother Edward consolingly. It'll be over before you know it. So Chad has to welcome the new bishop and um, the bishop and the new abbot, and he's very um, scared about that. It'd be like if, um, you know, a very shy person is, is second in command and suddenly they find themselves first in command and they weren't planning on that. He set off to the infirmary, well content with the prospect of being among the first to have a good look at the new abbot. Columba. He tried out the sound of the name thoughtfully. Columba. Irish man, maybe? We shall see. So it sounds like Brother Edward thinks he might know who the new abbot is going to be. When a man entered as a brother in the monas monastic life, my mother explained, he had done with the world and its ways and set out as though on a brand new life to try and live in every way with a single heart for God. He took three vows, one of poverty, that he would never have anything to call his own again, one of chastity, that he would never have a wife or a girlfriend, but all women would be like sisters to him, just as all men would be like brothers, and one of obedience, that he would submit to the authority of the abbot of the community and obey his word in everything. When he made his first vows after six months as a novice, the monk would be clothed in the habit of the order, which was a long robe, black for the Benedictines, with a separate hood called a cowl and wide sleeves and a leather belt. And I've learned about this through my friend, um, who was in the convent, that each convent, each um, life order, and I'm not Catholic, so I may not be using the words correctly, has their own dress. And so you, I was able to recognize a Dominican sister simply based on what they were wearing. To show that he really had finished with all the trappings of his old life, the monk was given a new name by his abbot as if he were a brand new person. The abbot usually tried to pick something appropriate to the man's character or background. Great Uncle Edward had been christened Edward as a baby after King Edward the Confessor, who was a good and holy king. So when he entered the religious life, his abbot said he should keep the same name, since no one could hope to be more devoted to the Lord than King Edward had been. And now the man the bishop was bringing was Columba, named after the Irish saint. Columba the Dove, the bird that represents gentleness and kindness and simplicity, as well as being a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. 
after Vespers, and Vespers, I don't have the exact definition of that, but it's a, it's a section of prayer or a section of something they do every evening. Brother Edward hurried with anticipation to the abbot's lodging to meet their dis distinguished supper guests who had ridden in an hour ago and had been welcomed to the guest house. Well, well, murmured Brother Edward as his new abbot entered the room, for it was indeed the son of his sister, Melissa, whom he had not seen for years. Columba, Edward chuckled to himself, meek and gentle dove, eh? Well, I shall be very surprised. The new ab abbot, whom Edward had known since babyhood, was certainly no dove. His mother, dead now, had been a proud, noble lady, and his father was a rich and powerful Norman aristocrat with a face as proud as an eagle and a grip on all that was was his, as fierce as the grip of an eagle's talons. When their child was born, he had a little sneak, beaky nose like a bird of prey and a flashing dark eye, quite startling in a pink baby face. His mother, laughing, called him Peregrine, and well-named he was for the Peregrine Falcon. For like a hawk he grew, fierce, proud, and arrogant, with a piercing look and a hawk's beak nose. Great-grandmother Melissa and I favored him in my looks, even all these years later. Years later. Okay, and that's, we're going to stop there. That's the first part of chapter two that I am going, that I have recorded.